start recording. So this program is supported through the United States Department of Agriculture Transition to Organic Partnership Program, or TOP. TOP is a program of the USDA Organic Transition Initiative and is administered by the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service National Organic Program. And you can find more information about TOP um, also in the chat, I'll put a link there. So today's webinar, Applying the Soil Principles in Organically Managed Row Crops, presented by Katja Kohler Cole from UNL Extension. Katja is the statewide soil health management extension educator where she teaches and does research in soil health and regenerative agricultural practices. She also serves as the USDA SARE state co-coordinator. SARE stands for Sustainable Agricultural Research and Education. Um, and that's to helping to raise awareness of sustainable agriculture um, resources, including funding through the SARE program. She also co-leads UNL's participation in the top program. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Katja. Thank you, Allison. Hi everyone. So yeah, as Allison said, um, I'm Katja Kuloko. I think I know at least half of you here. So I'm excited to see everyone. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and starting with my presentation. So like Allison said, I will, um, let me see. I will go through the talk and um, first I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what soil health means. That's a general thing that applies to all uh, farming, whether it is conventional or organic or something else entirely. Um, and then we, about halfway through, um, I'll transition over to what the soil health principles, what they, what they look like or how they can be achieved in organic systems. And before that, I will have a break so people can ask some questions. I, I wanna make sure that um, everybody understands the principles um, <clears throat> that we're talking about today. So, okay, you can all see my screen? Okay, I assume yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, just a little bit about me, like Allison said, um, I'm an extension educator. Before this role, I was um, a researcher in the agronomy department. And before that, I got my graduate degrees at UNL. I'm originally from Germany. So if you're wondering about the accent, that's where that is from um, my parents. And you can see all farmhouse there. My parents had a dairy farm. We still have to farm, but no more dairy. That's all gone. Um, and here you see a picture of my family. So um, I'm excited to be an extension educator. I started this role two years ago that the program is completely new. We didn't have a soil health person before. I also have a counterpart in the agronomy department. That's Carolina Cordova. She's an assistant professor and just got hired on shortly um, after me. Um, I also am the co coordinator for SARE, another role that I just started last year. Um, and it's really fun. And then the transitioning to organic farming system, which I'm super excited about uh, because like some of you heard this earlier, I actually uh, did my my PhD work, my my research in their uh, organically certified uh, fields that we had at Mead at the time, um, and and organic has always been a passion of mine. So I'm I'm really glad to to get back into that a little bit with that transition to organic farming program. Um, I will share my contact information. You can you can email me or, or call me with any questions that you have. So. Let's start talking about soil health. So what is a healthy soil? I think most of us can probably come up with a few characteristics of a healthy soil. What it feels like, maybe what it looks like, what it may smell like when we see it or touch it. Um, so healthy soils, um, I, typically people tend to think of a healthy soil as something that has, first of all, that it's dark color. That's a really good sign of healthy soil. Um, the dark color comes from carbon, which is the organic matter in the soil. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, so dark, dark color is a good sign. We want to see uh, a nice crumbly structure. Uh, we want to see the soil stick together in small aggregates. Um, we want to have, we want to see some, some signs of life in the soil, whether that is roots earthworms or other um, small small critters like small insects or spiders that are in the soil. Um, and lastly, um, a good soil, you know, it, an easy way to judge a good soil is does it support healthy, vibrant plants? 
So those are uh, the things that, you know, often come to mind when people start thinking about what is a healthy soil. Um, but what, how does this actually all, how are soils formed and how how do we get to the point of a soil being, or having all these function that we desire? Um, I always start my talks out, my soil health talks out with, with a little bit of history. Um, obviously, we all know this, we're sitting on some pretty good, for the most part, pretty good farmland here, especially in the eastern part of, uh, eastern and central part of Nebraska and further east. So we have some really, really productive soils here that formed under prairies, right? So we had that really, we had very productive uh, perennial grasses with deep root systems, not a whole lot of trees. Um, and there was this ecosystem which included large grazers, I have a picture here of the bison, is what, you know, what formed these these soils eventually over years and years, thousands of years, the grasses grew and then they died and they grew and they died. So there was a constant process of building and then decomposing, right? So the, the, the living things in the soil, the decomposers um, um, were really instrumental in building up these, these healthy soils. Um, but there were a lot of other things that, that kept our soils functioning. And like I mentioned, uh, part of it was the large grazers as such as bison or elk. Um, so they're a really integral part of our ecosystem. And then another thing was actually humans were, were a part or were a factor that managed the soils. Uh, we know that the uh, Native American tribes that lived here in, in these areas did set fire to the prairies occasionally. Um, probably mostly to, to get new fresh growth for the bison. But the other effect that it had was that it took out a lot of the trees, right? So it actually kept the prairies as prairies. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of these things here. Um, you know, I'm taking kind of a big ecosystem approach to thinking about how, how soils formed, but, um, you know, I, I want us all to always remember there's lots of things, you know, uh, lots of lots of animals, plants, and humans. All them, all of them together. Th those interactions really is what forms soils. Um, yeah, some of the soils most product, or some of the world's most productive soils formed under these grasslands. This is a picture of a uh, of a sort of neonative state, I would say, of a prairie uh, of a pasture near Clay Center. Um, so again, we had lots of lots of grasses, but also forbs. There were flowers in there. Um, and it supported a, a thriving ecosystem above ground and below ground. Um, I'm going to start moving a little bit more into soil properties um, and how soils are formed more at the at the mineral level. So as we know, um, I'm sure most of us have heard that at some point in time, whether that was in high school or college or, or later on, um, as we know, there is soil texture um, and also structure. We're starting out with the texture. So soil is formed of minerals, which are sand, silt, or clay. And usually it's a mix. It's almost always a mix. Um, the clay are, are really small, small particles that feel sticky when they're wet. Silt, slightly larger than clay, feels smooth when it's wet. And then, of course, sand, we all know what sand feels like. That's actually the largest particles. Um, again, they're in most soils, they're in, in some sort of combination. And the ideal combination is that what is shown in the middle of this of this diagram here, which is the loam. Um, so relatively equal parts of clay, salt, and sand, but not, not quite equal. Okay. Um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about minerals and trying to help us think through why they are important or how they, they influence the the, the health of the soil and the ecosystem that the soil is. So, so the minerals are all different sizes. And um, as we can see, so we have the big um, sand particle there that's between 0 0.05 and two millimeters. So two millimeters is about a 10th of an inch. Um, so we know what, what sand looks like. Silt is, is considerably smaller and then clay is, is tiny compared to sand. Um, nutrients, 
plant nutrients is what we're talking about. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all these things bind to the surface area. And because the smaller particles like clay have a much greater surface area, um, they can hold comparatively a lot more nutrients. Um, and then other things that bind to small particles like clay would be organic matter. Again, it's another thing that we're gonna, gonna mention here in a little bit. So we have the minerals, so they make up they make up the inorganic uh, part of the soil, all the different minerals. But what else is in the soil? And this is where, to me, it gets really interesting because I'm not a geologist. I love soils, but I, I don't, I don't, the, the mineral part doesn't interest me that much. I love the living stuff that's in the soil. So what else is in the soil? Well, organic matter. Um, organic matter is only about, well, roughly, it's a very rough number, 5% of the soil. Whereas the minerals, like we can see in this diagram here, are about 45, so a little bit less than half of the soil are minerals. And then, and that surprises most people, um, the other half of the soil would be air and water. So it's actually pore space. Um, and then roughly half of the pores are filled with water and roughly half of the pores are filled with air. Of course, that depends to a lot large extent on what kind of soils you have, uh, whether it has just rained or not, and so on. But this is just, you know, this is just a, a generalization here. But the organic matter, what is the organic matter? Well, organic just means derived from living matter, right? Derived from living things. So the organic matter in the soil are the things that are alive the things that are dead, and then the things that I call very dead, basically very decomposed things. So living roots and root exudates are part of the organic matter. Um, root exudates are those uh, sugars and amino acids that constantly leach out of healthy living roots. Um, we're learning that they're really, really important in the soil ecosystem because they are actually a preferred food source for most microbes. And so root exudates are, are, are excreted by plants and, and possibly uh, sort of intentionally excreted by plants. So they are part of the organic matter. Living microbes are part of the organic matter. Dead plants, dead microbes in varying stages of decay are part of the organic matter. And then all the waste from microbes and animals, that's also part of the organic matter. So that includes um, leaves or dead or dead uh, roots that includes, so, so things like crop residues, and that of course also includes manure, um, or just the waste that, that comes from, from microbes. So these are all the things that we are considering is organic matter. Um, I am going to touch on a new subject. So one thing that you will not hear me talk about is humus or humic substances in the soil. That's kind of what we used to think organic matter was. But there's a new concept. Um, there was a large, uh, very sort of keystone paper a few years ago um, by the uh, Lehman Lab. Uh, Dr. Lehman is a, um, a soil scientist at uh, Cornell University. And there's been a, a lot of discussion and, and new uh, development in the soil science world. So eventually it resulted in a new concept of organic matter. So humification, which is what some of us, including myself, still learned in college, humification does not exist and there are no humic substances in the soil. Instead, what we think of as organic or soil organic matter now is a continuum of progressively decomposing organic compounds. So again, it's the living things, it's the dead things, it's the things that are very dead in various stages of um, decay. And um, one of the, th the ways I visualize is, is, you know, I think about a compost and I have a few pictures here of actually my own compost pile. Um, so you can think about, you know, organic matter includes the things that just died. Well, it includes the living things, of course. Um, it includes the things that just died, so that would be leaves or, or things like that, that we can still kind of recognize what it used to be. And then the very dead things are things that have been, um, to a large extent, degraded. Um, so we can't 
see, we can't recognize anymore what they were. However, the important thing to remember is that everything is constantly decomposing and nothing is uh, resistant to decomposition. So, so here, I think the important concept to remember is that all things, all organic matter in the soil eventually turns over, um, but it needs a constant input um, in order to to use the soil sort of as a carbon thing. So if, we, if we're thinking about trying to um, use our soils as a carbon sink, we need a constant input because all the organic matter will eventually be decayed. Okay, that's all that I wanted to say about that, but we can talk more about it later. And I would highly encourage to read some of the fascinating new research on the new organic matter concepts if you're interested in that. Okay. Um, organic matter, for us in the soil health world, world, organic matter is the single most important indicator of healthy soils. So as I already mentioned, organic matter is constantly being decomposed, in other words, being eaten by microbes. So microbes feed on the organic matter in the process, they break down the organic molecules until eventually just carbon dioxide and the nutrients are left. That, uh, so that's the nutrient cycle, basically, the carbon cycle and all the other nutrient cycles happen uh, with microbes and the organic matter. Organic matter helps to make the soil more porous and it helps to infiltrate and store water. Um, nutrients can also bind, bind to organic matter, sort of like they can bind to minerals. They can also bind to organic matter. Um, organic matter is a carbon sink, but again, um, it will eventually be decomposed. So we need a constant input of living things into the soil uh, if we want to increase the organic matter content of our soils. Um, when we're thinking about what parts of the organic matter stay in the soil for a really long time, um, it's usually in soils that have a high mineral content like clay soils. Some of the organic matter can bind to clay particles that that way it's not so accessible to um to microbes so some of that sticks around for longer um organic matter can also be included in aggregates and again um then it's not so accessible to microbes so um it it can it can stick around in the soil for longer periods of time okay I'm going to be starting to talk a little bit about more about actually the all the different organisms that we can find in the soil. So the soil food web, again, I've just been talking about microbes in general. Now we're getting a little bit more into the details, into the specifics. Um, so the microbes in the soil are what is basically decomposing everything. It's driving all of these important soil functions. It's helping, um, it's helping infiltrate water, cycle nutrients, and so on. Um, a healthy soil is a living ecosystem. So I think it's important that we learn a little bit more about some of those living things in the ecosystem that is our soil. So as with every ecosystem, a healthy soil starts out with plants, right? We need plants. Plants are the only living things on this earth that can make organic molecules, which the rest of us, including humans, eat, right? So plants make organic molecules. They make sugars through the uh, process of photosynthesis. Then, so plants are here, they're my first trophic level. Then we're getting into the next levels, which are the things that decompose. Um, the most uh, common decomposers in the soil are bacteria. Bacteria are the smallest soil organisms. Um, they are, they, uh, decompose simple organic molecules. So think of stuff like um, a fresh cover crop or something that's just been added to the soil. Um, think of think of simple compounds like just sugars, things like that. So bacteria like to decompose those things. Bacteria are also um, also able to fix nitrogen, which is important um, for legumes. So they're, they're uh, undergoing symbiotic relationships with legumes, fixing nit nitrogen. Uh, next up, we have fungi. Fungi also decompose uh, 
decompose organic molecules. They are able to decompose much more complex organic molecules. Think like, you know, in a farm system, it would be the tough corn stalks, things like that. Uh, bacteria have a really hard time to break that stuff down, but fungi can break that down. Fungi are less numerous in the soil, um, and they, are, they, are, they take a lot longer to reproduce, and they're a lot more fragile than bacteria. So fungi, um, the two big groups that we're thinking about in terms of a agricultural setting would be saprophytes. So these are the typical decomposers, saprophytic fungi. And then we have the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and one group in particular is getting more and more attention, and that's the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, or also called AMF. So these mycorrhizal fungi undergo, again, beneficial relationships with plants. They actually live inside plant roots and um, they get um, sugars from the plants. And in turn, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi with their really long hyphae, like long, um, thin growth, sort of like root-like, but not much thinner than roots, they can grow out into the soil and access water and nutrients, especially phosphorus, that plants can otherwise not access. So they help with the nutrition of plants, um, muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Fungi are also super important for soil aggregation. We're gonna talk more about aggregation, but basically they excrete glue-like substances that really help bind all these soil particles, the minerals, the organic matter, everything else that's in there. They help bind it all together and make nice, nice aggregates. So that's fungi. Couple of pictures. Oh, right, yeah, fungi. Okay, couple of pictures of fungi and bacteria. Um, again, the mycorrhizal fungi they have to live on plants. They cannot just live in the soil. So here is one hint. Um, if we want to have more of these plants, we need or more of these fungi of the AMF fungi. We constantly have to have a host plant in the soil, meaning a crop or a cover crop. Most of our crops and cover crops uh, undergo those, those beneficial relationships with, with AMF, with AM fungi. So, but we always have to have one in the, in the ground. Um, so they, so fungi are really usually closely associated with roots. Um, bacteria, a lot of bacteria also live very close to roots, although these ones here uh, live inside an organic particle, probably an aggregate. Um, okay. I'm talking, uh, yeah, roots, I'm mentioning roots because I've already talked about the exudates. So that is a high quality food source for bacteria and fungi and other microbes. So that's actually why we find most microbes in, uh, in the soil or close to the roots or even on the roots. Roots also provide habitat for the, fun for the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, for example. Um, and then, um, yeah provide habitat, leave some, some shelter to surface from water. So, yeah. Okay. Um, a couple of other players in the soil food web. As with any food web, the soil food web has predators. We don't often think about that. We're just thinking about our decomposers. But of course, we need something that keeps those populations in control. So, um, protozoa are single-celled organisms. We used to think they're animals. I don't really know if we're grouping them with animals anymore. I don't I currently know where they're at, but let's just say protozoa, single-celled organisms that eat bacteria. In the process, they excrete or release plant-available ammonium. So again, they're important for the nutrient cycle because ammonium is a nutrient that plants can take up just like that, or a form of nitrogen that plants can take up. Then we have nematodes. Um, they kind of get a bad rep because a few of them are pathogens, but most of them are actually very beneficial. Um, they too eat fungi and bacteria, so help uh, keep those populations under control. And then we have larger animals, arthropods, which would be insects and spiders, earthworms and small mammals. They're the ones that are taking plants, living plants or residue of plants, dead, dead plants, and they're shredding it. So they're eating part of it and the rest of it, they just leave on the soil. They break it apart in smaller and smaller particles, um, which makes it easier for the microbes then to attach. Um, so they sort of, in a way, pre-digest the residue for bacteria and fungi. 
Um, okay. In that process, in that whole process of nutrient cycling, all these actions that are going on, um, living things actually form aggregates. So we have our plant roots. So the aggregates, again, are, are particles of soil, the minerals, sand, clay, silt, together with some organic matter, together with living roots and fungal hyphae that kind of clump together and kind of stick together. Why are aggregates important? Well, first of all, they give soil structure. A soil with uh, stable aggregates, they don't have to be very big necessarily, but stable. Stable aggregates uh, is less vulnerable to erosion, to wind and water erosion. That makes a lot of sense. If the soil sticks together, sticks to each other, sticks to other particles, it's less vulnerable to being blown away or being washed away. Um, the aggregates also form habitats again for microbes uh, bacteria can can hang out inside of aggregates and kind of hide from from predators um they organic matter can bind to aggregates um and then aggregates are also where you have a lot of aggregates you have a lot of pore space so again a soil with good aggregation aggregation will have more pore space so it it can infiltrate more water it can hold more water um, and it also has more um, more more air flow coming into it. Um, one of the things that I just learned a, a few weeks ago, do you know when it rains, um, water infiltrates into the soil? We usually we can we can have we ha we know that smell when it rains, right? A lot of some people even know where it's from. It's it's actinomycetes. But why do we smell that only when it rains? It's because when it rains, the water infiltrates into the soil and the air comes out of it, right? So that's just a, a neat little concept. You know, it helps us to understand there's a constant flux um, of liquids and gases and things like that in the air are in the soil. So aggregation is very important to a, a healthy soil and aggregates are made by living things. By and large, they're made by roots and hyphae and bacteria just gluing everything together, binding everything together. Um, so this is what a healthy soil looks like. This is sort of the full picture. It's a nice diagram. I didn't make it. Um, we have some larger uh, aggregates here consisting of silt and clay and some organic matter over here. I don't know if you guys can see this, but SOM, that stands for soil organic matter. We have a lot of pores here. Some of the pores are filled with water. Others are filled with air. We have different kinds of microbes, different sizes. Um, we have some bacterial colonies here. We have some fungal hyphae, we have roots. So this is kind of a diagram, what a soil looks like. And, um, and we see a lot of nice aggregates here. And, and what we probably don't pay attention to is all the space between the aggregates. Again, that's the poor space that, that we get when we have a well-aggregated, a well-structured soil. Um, again, here, you know, I just wanted to show that uh, one more time. So the pore space takes up about 50% of our soil. So even though we think soil is like the solid thing, about 50% is just water and air. Okay. Any questions before I move into the soil health principles? Any questions on anything? I think we can take a couple of minutes. Katya, will you explain again why we smell rain? Yeah. So when 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 it rains, we get that earthy smell in the air, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of all, all most of us know that sense. Oh, it smells good, like after a rain. So that is, and why why do we not smell that when it's dry and it's not raining? It's because when it rains. The rain goes into the soil, basically fills the pores, and the the gases that are that are making that smell are then coming out of the soil. So the water basically pushes the air out of the soil. Oh, wow. and that's why we smell that. 
That is so cool. Thank you. I know you. it's so cool, isn't it, Audrey? Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? I have a question. What, in your uh, opinion or your experience, are um, acceptable levels of organic matter, especially in organic farming? Yeah. Um, I mean, so we tend to think of organic matter as something, you know, we rather, I mean, we always tend to think the more is better because our soils used to have, used, used to be pretty high in organic matter, you know, 5%, 6%. Um, and now I think, I mean, most of our soils are less than 3% probably. Um, so I can't, I can't tell you, you know, I mean, do you know what your soil is? I don't because I'm a critter guy, but uh, I would tell you that uh, I asked the question because I had uh, a bit of contact with some organic farmers uh, in northeast Iowa. They were a Trappist monastery, and I think they had maybe three or four thousand acres of organic farm ground. And um, the person that was in charge of their organic program said that. Um, they like to get their organic matter up to 8%. And where was that, Ed, again? It's in northeastern Iowa. It's not okay. very far, really, from Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, good for them. <laughs> I, I think it would be pretty <laughs> difficult to get it to that point. But, yeah, again, we tend to think, you know, the more the better at this point. I don't know. I don't know agricultural soils that have too much organic matter. Okay, any other questions? I don't know, Ellison, if you have anything in the chat. If not, I will move on. Nope, just some good jobs well explained in the chat. Okay, great, perfect. Well, let's move on to the soil health principles. So um, about, well, I, th I think it probably about 15 to 20 years ago now, um, the NRCS, um, I think it was mostly Jay Furrow with the NRCS, he came up with the soil health principles and, you know, none of them was necessarily new or, um, or, or not known before. But I think what they did was to just kind of put these five principles together um, and kind of start using that as a guideline to how should we manage salts so they are healthy. Um, and the first soil health principle is to maximize the presence of living roots in the ground. The second one is to minimize disturbance to the soil, which can take, disturbance can take many different forms. Um, the third one is to maximize soil cover, whether that is with living roots or a mulch, but soils should not be bare. Basically, we shouldn't be able to see the soil. The fourth, um, is to maximize biodiversity, including the diversity of plants and animals. So crops, livestock, livestock, but also all kinds of other things in the soil. And then the fifth one, which was added just a few years ago, is know your context. Um, you know, the soil health principles were not necessarily uh, developed. They were developed, again, for all farming systems. But for me, they're really uh, synchronous with organic farming because they aim at growing a farm's fertility, soil health, by just new using its natural resources and natural cycles. So um, so I think it, it fits very, very well with organic farming. And I think organic farmers are probably um, more um, willing and probably already doing a lot more of these things than, um, than, than non-organic farmers. So we're gonna go through and talk about each one of the principles. So how to achieve the soil health principles in organic systems. So first off, maximize the presence of living roots. Um, in my introduction, talking about food web in the soil, I mentioned several times, um, roots are super important because they constantly leach out those exudates, preferred high quality food for microbes. So, and some of our, um, Soil organisms, especially the AM fungi, those mycorrhizal fungi that are so beneficial to plants, they they need a, they always need a host plant in the soil. They can't just live by themselves. So, 
this is kind of the basis for having that that presence of living roots on the ground all year round. And then, of course, all the, the actions are, and the functions with aggregation. So how can we achieve living roots? We can do cover crops in the off-seasonal fallow periods. We can do relay, relay or intercropping. And of course, we can, we can start looking at some perennials. So um, cover crops, I've done, I've done a lot of research with cover crops um, and corn and soybean systems here in the state. Um, usually we plant cereal rye after corn or soybean harvest, and we terminate it before planting corn or soybean the following spring. Um, it is, it works, the cereal rye is very hardy, but we typically, in our typical systems, we just don't get a lot of biomass. Um, just one megaton, which is about two tons per, per acre, or 2,000 pounds per acre, which is kind of what this picture here looks like. Um, it's just about six inches, inches high, six to eight inches. Um, our biggest challenge to getting more biomass and getting more from our cover crop in general is timely planting. We just, most of the time when we're in a corn soybean system, we just don't have the time in the fall to plant early. Um, so cereal rye is pretty common, fall planted cereal rye. Um, more and more people are looking into hairy veg as a nitrogen source. Um, that hairy veg needs even an even longer growing period than cereal rye. This picture here um, is this was probably my best cereal rye and hairy veg year. Um, so rarely does it look better than this in most of our systems. But again, you know, if we're making cover crops all focused, then we will uh, we will probably overcome uh, some of these challenges. Um, another thing that we are experimenting more with is spring planting cover crops. So this is a, the other picture, small picture here is a, a oat pea mix that we planted in March and terminated in May. I, I should say this is not in, this was in a conventional system, but we're exploring some of things. And I have, I have experimented with some of these spring planted cover crops because sometimes, um, because we can use some different species that are cool season species, but kind of produce more growth in the spring than Sierra rye. Um, and if we're, if we're planting them, in early spring, um, it's just another window that we can uh, that we can explore. So these are cover crops for fall and spring planting. Um, cover crops are also a great way to bring in some livestock. We can graze them. Um, what I'm really excited about is the cover crops uh, that we can plant in the summer. These are pictures from our experiments with uh, different species and varieties of summer annual cover crops. They are highly productive, uh, whatever it is, whether you grow grasses like pearl millet or legumes like cowpea, I mean, they usually put on an enormous amount of biomass. Um, the other nice thing is they will winter kill. So they can kind of be, we don't have to do an extra trip to terminate them and they provide a nice thick mulch um, over winter. So we're covering the soil. Um, these cover crops, you know, obviously not, not many of us are planting winter wheat anymore. Um, so that limits their, um, their, uh, probably their selection. Um, but they are really, uh, really something that I, I would love for organic farmers to, to explore a little bit more. Um, relay and intercropping. That's also a cool thing. This is actually what I did my uh, PhD study on. It was on on uh, in, or under sowing red clover and white clover into winter wheat. So there's some of the pictures here. Uh, it's a neat, neat method to establish clovers. So why do we grow clovers? Of course, we're using them as a nitrogen source in organic farms, and they can also be used as a forage. Um, so. The system that we had is we planted in very, very early spring, late February to March, preferably on snow or ice. We would just broadcast the clover seed. Um, it would just kind of hang out, didn't grow much, as you can see in the pictures here, just it, it would just kind of hang out in the wheat canopy, but once the wheat was harvested, it would really start growing. And then we uh, let it grow until the following spring, terminated it and then planted corn, and then the corn was followed by soybean. So um, it's a good way to, so that under sowing is a good way to establish clovers and they can be pretty productive and um, really good for soil health too. 
Uh, we've also tried this in, in conventional system and it worked there fairly well also. So relay and intercropping are, are other ways to achieve the soil health principles. The relay cropping, I we have less, um, I would say we have less uh, experimental evidence for this. These pictures here are actually from, from organic farmers who uh, who showed me their plots and kind of what they did with it. So uh, on the left, that's actually JJ Cranstrom. Um, I visited his farm in 2022 and he, and it was a, it was an experiment. He, he planted soybean into winter barley um, under a pivot. So their big thing was don't farm naked, um, always have something growing. They used the barley. So they, they planted the barley in the fall, um, planted the soybean into it in May, um, their their goal was to achieve uh to 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 reduce or eliminate um wheat control for the soybeans so the barley was kind of their wheat control in that system um and uh so that, so that was an interesting thing you know certainly uh lots of lots of kinks that need to be worked out but i, I think it's it's really worthwhile to to uh continue to explore some of those options um, and this is the um, uh, Knuth farm near me here, um, picture from August 2022. They planted corn into alfalfa, alpha, so they wanted to establish alfalfa uh, alpha and plant corn into it. And again, you know, do away, have benefits for soil health, but also do away with, with weed control. We're starting with the second soil health principle, and I just wanted to check, okay, I need to hurry up a little bit. Second soil health principles is minimize disturbance. So reducing tillage, avoiding compaction, avoiding high amounts of inputs as that can also set off sort of the balance of the system. So um, I'm just gonna touch briefly on this. I don't have, I have not tried this out, but there is uh, more and more research into uh, reduced till or no-till organic systems. And one is called the cover crop based rotational reduced till. So, um, Aaron Silver with the University of Wisconsin-Madison has done a lot of research in that, and of course, Rodale Institute with their roller crimper. So here, the idea is to establish a high biomass cover crop, usually it's cereal rye. Um, so you'd have to really plant it early, plant it at a high density. Um, the idea is to have as much biomass as possible in the spring. In the spring, it's mechanically terminated, usually with a roller crimper. You could mow it too, but it's usually with a roller crimper. I have a picture here of one. And then a crop, and it it's, tends to be soybean, is planted directly into the mulch. And then the idea is, again, the mulch suppresses weed, so you don't need further weed control, and you get all these soil health benefits from not tilling. Um, this is a system that has received quite a bit of attention, um, and I think that is, um, again, you need a good amount of moisture. That's that's kind of, you know, where it, where it often gets a little bit difficult for us. But I think that's a very promising uh, system, even for Nebraska. Um, benefits of reducing tillage. So um, tillage is, tillage destroys aggregates. Tillage also destroys organisms, so, so organisms, especially fungi, uh, fungi. So I've already mentioned fungi have those like long, thin, gross, uh, gross which are the fungal hyphae, um, and they get destroyed in tillage. So it, it hurts the fungi, tillage hurts fungi populations. That's one thing that we see with no-till, almost always do our fungi, fungi populations go up, and we want those. We want a lot of fungi in our soil. Um, pill uh, tillage, you know, it destroys the soil, soil aggregate, so it, it the soil loses its structure. It cannot it loses its pore space, it can't infiltrate water and air as well anymore. However, you get that initial oxygen, oxygen flush after tillage, but actually what it does is, uh, you know, more, more oxygen means bacteria can de decompose more soil organic matter. And that's why we see such big decreases in organic matter uh, once our soils were, were being plowed under and started to till on a regular basis. So, and, and reducing tillage also saves time and energy. Um, the third soil health principle is maximizing soil cover. So I already talked about cover crops. They do that, of course. I, uh, I talked about the mulching, um, leaving crop residues on the, on the soil surface. That all counts using cover crops. 
Um, so I'm not going to get it, go into more detail here. And then maximizing biodiversity. So diversity of plants and animals. That tends to get a little bit more tricky. We can, of course, have a good crop rotation. Uh, we should do a little bit more than just corn and soybean, which is better than just continuous corn. Um, so adding cover crops, adding winter wheat, possibly adding a forage legume. Those are all good things to, to bring diversity back. Um, but also thinking about adding perennials to the system that can be in the form of a, of a woody buffer or shelter belt. Um, it can be prairie strips or other habitats for perennial plants. Animal diversity. Of course, integrating livestock would be ideal. It, it gets a little bit tougher, but um, when we bring in, in cover crops, we can usually, it, it facilitates bringing back the livestock because you can graze the cover crops. Um, also consider your underground livestock. And I really love this quote by Sir Albert Howard, mother nature never attempts to farm without animals. Again, you know, just looking at, at farming as an ecosystem. Composting, I love composting. For me, that's part of the soil health principles. We're recycling on-farm waste and it's so beneficial um, for, those, for those underground livestock. Um, yeah. Finally, the last soil health principle and probably to me, it's my favorite one. Probably, I think it's kind of the most important one. They actually just added it a few years ago and it is called Know Your Context. So what's your context? Your context can be anything. It can be your climate. It can be the resources that you have access to. Do you have access to irrigation? Um, do you have access to labor? Um, what's your community like? Your family? What are your relationships with others? What's your sense of purpose? So that really, to a large degree, will will uh, will to a large degree determine um, what you're doing. So or what you can do. So you know, just consider your context. Um, really important principle. Um, yeah, I think, so I'm pretty much at the end of my presentation here. I think, you know, building a healthy, thriving, living soul takes time and consideration, but it is well worth the efforts. Um, that kind of sums it up, I think, for me. I have a few more resources that I wanted to share, but I also want to make sure we have time for questions. Oh, we have a few more minutes. So, some good resources, and, and I can share my presentation too, so you have those links here, but the Midwest Cover Crop Council, excellent information on cover crops. SARE, of course, is, is information on all kinds of different things. The Rodale Institute is Institute and ATRA. Um, if you are thinking about planting more cover crops or just want to learn about them, this the Midwest Cover Crops Field Guide, you can download that on the web. It is, well, you can download it for free. You can buy it. It is $5. I have plenty of copies of it. So if you need one, just let me know and I'll, I'll get you one. Another great resource um, for anyone who really wants to get a little bit more into the micro microbes, Farming with Soil Life is a new SARE publication. Um, you can download it on their website for free. I also have a few copies of the book that I'm willing to part with if, um, if anyone wants one. And this is a cool uh, um, little pocket guide from the Xerxes Society. Of course, I have to advertise for some of our other programs here. We have an upcoming field day, April 30th at the Haskell Ag Lab near Concord in Northeast Nebraska, where we are showing off our cover crop variety trials. We have 30, over 30, I think 33 different varieties of cover crops, including a bunch of different mixes. Um, we'll also tour some other plots by my colleagues that are looking at um, mulches and things like that. So it it's, should be a really, really great field day. Of course, it's free. Um, like most of our field days. And then August 28th, we will have our second soil health and cover crops field day at Enrike near Mead. Um, showing our demo plots. Uh, we're going to be out in the field. It's all just going to be hands-on. Should be really fun um, learning how to assess soil health in your own field. So um, we're also doing small group discussions and networking. So more details to come, I should say. And that is the end of it. And yeah, with that, I will take questions. Are there any questions? Well, Katja, this is David. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. 
Uh, one thing I put into the notes is, you know, certainly the first thing that I was bombarded with questions about as I got more in the organic space, and that was as you strive to not minimize the soil. Um, unfortunately, many organic farmers have to control their weeds through tillage, even though they hate doing it. Uh -huh. uh, so I think if there is one problem that we could help solve, it would be how do we control those weeds uh -huh. in different ways. Uh, and not have to till, even if it's light, because light tillage still disrupts things. So uh -huh. uh, any thoughts on maybe emerging technology or new ideas that organic farmers can start to think about? Yeah, um, and that's a good point. I mean, it it would be hard to completely do away with tillage. And I think the 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 key for us in organic farm is just being better than what we're right now. So maybe not completely eliminating, but reducing. So I think, you know, the roller crimping cover crops, I think that's a promising technology. Um, when you get a good amount of cover, of course, you should try it out on a field that doesn't have a ton of weeds, but you can really, I think, make that work. Um, but you need a, a lot of bio, a, a lot of cover crop biomass and then roller crimp it at the right time and and plant soybean into it. Um, so this can work. There's also, you know, there's there's a lot of things that are looking at even things like compost extracts and biologicals right now that are kind of a hot topic. You know, there, there's people that are, I just looked at some studies yesterday that were uh, on the SARE website where they're looking at whether um, using some of these compost extracts can inhibit um, weed seed germination. So I think, you know, there's, I don't think there's anything conclusive yet, but we can. Then, of course, we have a lot of other um, weed, you know, technology like the the weed, the the electric zappers or the um, flamers, you know. Um, so the mechanical weed control, I think, is is big. But I would like to bring in um, more cover crops because I I really believe that mulch, along with the alle allelopathic action, I didn't really talk about that, but rye especially can really uh, suppress some weed seed germination um, because of that, the allelopathic uh, compounds that excretes, yeah. Thank you. Acha, there is one, um, a question in the chat. What is the best definition for regenerative agriculture and can we aspire to increase the quantity and quality of our topsoil on commercially farmed ground? Um, the best for me, I, I think I would, you know, I would define regenerative agriculture as something that improves soil health or soil quality constantly. Um, and can we do that on commercial ground? I think, yes, we can. Um, again, you know, for us, when we're just looking, it helps to really just look at soil organic matter, you know, that is such a good indicator. Um, but there's a couple of other indicators to that we, my colleague and I, um, that we recommend as for soil health tests, organic matter, wet aggregate stability, a lot of labs do that now, um, and soil respiration, which actually measures the activity and abundance of microbes in the soil. These three tests, you know, you can use these over time to really see if you're making progress. And I think you can, um, you know, if you're doing things like cover cropping um, along with, you know, selecting crops that are really suitable, leaving residue on the ground. I mean, you can't always just take, take, take from the soil, you know, you, you have to give something back. So I think that to me is like the important thing. I don't know if that was a super good <laughs> definition. It wasn't very concise. <laughs> Oh, Allison, you're muted. Leave that to me to do that. I did put your uh, email address in the chat so people could see that. Okay. Um, and then we also just had a, a, so David had mentioned his comment about tilling. And we also had a comment from Kevin Fulton, the soil organic matter in uh -huh. his crop fields range uh -huh. from four to six and a half percent. And in his native prairie and perennial pastures, it's five to seven. That's good. That's really good. You're doing something right, Kevin. 
Yeah. I would be interested in knowing, did you, are you doing tillage? I mean, or are you trying to reduce tillage? What are the things that you're doing that you think keeps your organic matter that high or improved your organic matter? Uh, using cover crops and integrating livestock. I mean, yep. we grade every acre and we sometimes haul hay in and feed in the wintertime. But um, but yeah, livestock is yeah. key. High stock densities and, and on cover crops. And, yep. And, and, I, and, you know, try to minimize tillage. But, yeah, we're doing tillage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think one underappreciated effect of manure applications is that is like it really increases your organic matter in the soil. Um, even if you just apply it every, you know, three years or four years or something like that, you will you will really make a dent or or a bump in the organic matter concentration. So, yeah. Yes, the recording will be available. I'm not sure if it will be today, um, but it usually the turnaround is pretty quick. And I will send an email out to everyone who signed up so you'll know when it's ready. Awesome. Okay. Well, great. Well, we're right at time, so that was perfect. Thank great. you, Sasha, for joining yeah. us today and sharing with us. Thank you. <laughs> And thank you, everybody, for joining us today and participating. And again, look for that email, and we'll let you know when the recording's ready, and you can share it. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. Okay. Thank you all. Have a Thanks great day. Thanks, everyone, for coming on. Thanks yeah, to both of you for the program. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Great. Bye-bye.